You know what? You guys are joking, but I hope one day before I leave this earth that I do have a student that's running for some office. That would be like. What? Not hard. No, I'm not saying who. I've had lots of students, William. Lots. I think if I was president, my vice president would be Kevin Grass. Like, this. <laughs> okay. I gotta get All right. All right. Let's get back at the task at hand. We could talk about office and all that afterwards. So we ended up yesterday talking about some of the reasons again why people are moving into cities. We've got, again, all the people um, uh, moving here. We've kind of sort of talk it about, talked about some of the strains that it would put on the city. Um, but we're also going to talk about some of the improvements living in the city has made. Is this not the next one? Okay. Um, so technology improves city life. As city sizes swell, American innovators develop new technologies to improve living conditions. And again, this kind of connects with our our robber barons, captains of industry chapter, uh, our last chapter. Skyscrapers, uh, they were steel buildings, 10 stories or taller, built, bless you, built because there was no room left on the ground to expand. So that was what I was talking about yesterday, the fact that these uh New York City is made up of islands, so they can't spread out, so they have to go up. And in going up, two things needed to happen. We needed to get something lighter than iron. Iron's too heavy to build up high, so we get steel, which is a light, strong um, building material. But then we also have to have elevators, ways to go up uh, these buildings that, and even though our note says 10 stories are taller, really around this time, we're going to stop at that 10 story mark. That's about uh, the top uh, level that we'll go. We have the safety elevator. And then one of the really important parts is central heating. We don't have central air conditioning um, in the United States until around 1940, 1950. Um, but we do have heating and that essentially is a really important part of being able to move people into these big tall buildings um, and get rid of the dangers of um, fireplaces and uh, actually having fires inside buildings. Uh, this will be the big one, mass transit. Mass transit reshapes nation cities. And one of the first things that will move a lot of people, mass transit means moving a lot of people. And the first ones will be electric and they'll be electric streetcars. Um, and those will be, they look like train cars, except they run on um, uh, electricity. They'll have this big giant pole that comes up and it'll have a hook and it'll hook on to power lines. And that's how it generates its power. Within a decade, every major city is going to follow that. Electric streetcars are quieter, cleaner, more efficient than coal driven uh, commuter trains or horse drawn trolleys. But, and here is one of the first real issues for city planners is traffic control. We don't have traffic laws. Traffic laws are very much similar at this time as boating laws on a lake, right? Those of you that have boats, you know, there's like these un- spoken laws about which side of the lake you stay on, the wake you don't make in certain parts. Um, I say unwritten, some of them are written, but both, most voters abide by these rules and take care of each other because there's not lanes or stoplights or anything on a lake. Our streets were very much like that. There was no traffic rules or regulations, no stoplights, no stop signs, really not a lot uh, to um, create any kind of traffic flow. So what happens is we get congestion. We get huge congestion in these city streets. And this becomes some of the first things that planners have to work on as city planners, traffic flow. So I know it doesn't feel like it, especially if you're going down Third Street and you're in a hurry. 
in Terre Haute. But if you really go down Third Street and you go the actual speed limit, you should be able to make it all the way through without hitting a light until you probably get to the real downtown area in front of the courthouse. That's where it'll all kind of jam up because you've got some left-hand turn lane signals. But if you start and you actually do the speed limit, you should be able to make it because they have the lights timed. Now, what really throws everything off of those two students, stupid lights in front of Menards. I'm not sure why there has to be two lights there, but that throws everything off as well. But that's what city planners do. City planners time those lights. They look at traffic flow. Um, and this is no traffic flow. This is what city planners have to start with. Number one, we've got all different types of vehicles. These are the streetcars, and if you've never seen one, this is what I was talking about. They connect onto those poles, and I'm sorry, onto the uh, electric wire that's attached to the poles. So here are our streetcars. Then we have the beginnings of trucks, right? We have combustible engine cars already. We still have horses being drawn by wagons, and then we have people moving. And everyone's trying to go at once. <coughs> we don't have any designated streets like uh, surface streets that take these type of cars that are moving big old logs away so that these people can get to their jobs. That is mass confusion. And that will be one of the first things that these city planners start to look at. How can we plan our cities so that things move easier in those thoroughfares? If you've ever been to older cities, cities like Boston, New York City, not quite as much, but or, or New Orleans. New Orleans is a, one of the worst cities in the world to drive in. If you're driving in New Orleans, you could be driving on a two-way street and without any any warning, all of a sudden you're going the wrong way on a one-way street because of the way the streets were built when that town was originated. Same with Boston. Boston's a difficult city to get around as well because they have, uh, they're a really old city and the city built up first before roads that needed uh, uh, width for, tr for cars and things. In um, most older cities, and Sullivan has all that little cobblestone, which those cobblestone bricks are not good for, for cars, especially in the wintertime. But those were the first streets that were built. So we have to figure out a way to create a better traffic flow. That's a city planner. In 1897, Boston solved this problem by building the first subway system. And so a subway system is underground. It takes, obviously, a long time to build these things because you have to move a lot of ground. But it is, again, a really great way to move people. New York is going to follow suit in 1904. I do not think in the whole place in the entire world there is a more difficult subway system to navigate than New York City. It is the most difficult subway system. I have ridden subway systems in New York, in Boston, in London, in Paris. There is not one that's worse than New York City. I do not know how they function. It makes no sense. Mass transit makes it possible for middle and upper class people to move. It's uh, Subways are one of the reasons why people can live in those cities without cars. So one of the very first Real jobs I had with my college degree was up in Chicago. I worked for Underwriters Laboratory. So I'm young. I'm working with a lot of young people. I didn't grow up in Chicago, um, obviously, but the people that I worked with did. I was the only one with a driver's license, which I found really odd. And their explanation was, can't find a place to park their car. Now, my husband was in the military, so we had a place on base to park the car, but that was their issue. I don't need a car. I can get around on the L, I can get around the bus, and most people that live in cities, that's part of their budget, is buying um, a, an L or a subway ticket for a month. And uh, they are allowed to ride as often as they want with that pass. So these mass transit make it possible for people to move. And as cities grow, planners begin to use zones. So if we go back to that first, that picture where all that stuff was happening, one of the reasons it's happening is that cities aren't zoned for things. So for those of you that live in 
the city limits of Sullivan. I don't know the rules. I'm about to make this up. So please don't hold me to it, but I'm making it up. Um, there are zoning laws, zoning laws that are very specific and particular. It tells you how many animals that you can have, how many cats you can have. Can you have chickens in the city limits? Can you have goats in the city limits? Um, it tells businesses where they can be in the city limits. And in the city limits of Sullivan, you would be surprised, I think, to find how many not businesses are in the city limits because once you're inside the city limits, you have a lot more requirements that you have to do and you also pay higher taxes. It's why Walmart is on the other side of uh, the city limits. I think the out city limits going out like towards Graysville, I think it's the Elks or it's right around the Elks. That's why Walmart's over there. That's why all the fast food places are over there. Um, same reason with the hospital. The hospital is not in the city limits. If you're inside the city, there are zoning uh, criteria that tell you where you can and cannot put things. If you want to build an apartment complex in Sullivan, there are very few places you can do that because people that have houses do not want an apartment building put up behind them. So that's one of the first things city planners start to do is zone the parts of the city to do certain things. So they set aside place for heavy industry, for factories, for financial institutions, homes, public spaces like libraries and governments. And that begins as a planner to plan your city so that things start to make sense and your city can grow effectively and not um, haphazardly. Parks, again, will play an important part in cities. Um, New York Central Park, Detroit has a park, Washington DC has a park, Palo Alto is in uh, California. All have park systems. Um, and those park systems, again, are really important for um, quite a few things. Psychologically to have green space, physically to have green space for good air. People need outdoors as much as I like to tell myself we don't, we do. In Chicago, bless you, architect Daniel Burham designed an ideal city for Chicago's 1893 World Columbian Exposition called the White City, um, which has become very popular recently because a, a book was written about one of the, uh, a serial killer that was killing a whole lot of people there. It's called The Devil in the White City. It's a really good book if you'd like to read it. And then Philadelphia is going to purchase land along the rivers to protect the city's water supply. So... At this point, we dump everything in water. And I'm going to tell you this that should kind of make your you all just go, Ugh. but you ask your parents, and especially um, any of you that had grandpas or dads or moms or anybody that changed their own oil. Um, most everybody prior to probably the 1990s changed their own oil. It was a very simple process. I knew how to do it. It's very simple. When you change the oil, you would get it and open the little um, screw, let the oil drain, take the oil pan, walk down to the edge of the street to the grate where all the water drained and pour the oil in the drainage ditch. We all did that. And then that water then proceeded or that oil then proceeded to get intermixed in the, dra uh, in the uh, ground and into our clean water. We did that forever, ever until probably the mid 70s, when it got illegal to do that, took old people a really long time to stop doing that. Um, but it takes us a long time to figure out we have to stop putting stuff in water because it's going to come back into our bodies in some way or another. Um, and slowly we get that, but it's still at this point, if you're a manufacturer at the end of the day, any toxic materials that you have perfectly legal to dump it in the water and get rid of it and start all over again. So our next thing we're going to look at, that's a problem is housing. Where are you going to put all of these people? They are overcrowded in 1890, New York's Lower East Side had a population of more than 700 people an acre. I try to remember, we do this just about every year, have to, but I, I think I remember Sullivan County is at about 21 people. 21 people per acre versus 
700 people in an acre. And many of you probably know that New York City apartments, and they really don't have houses in New York City, their apartments are outrageously priced. And they're not outrageously priced just because they're in New York City. They're outrageously priced because there's not enough. And so people are um, um, rent or people that rent out these apartments can increase the rent because they have 10 people that need to rent. And so they can increase, which is and will make this very difficult to live in New York City. Seriously, a, a, a studio apartment that's probably maybe 900 square feet, just a big old room, probably is almost $2,000 a month. 2000 It's outrageous. And it's not outrageous just because it's New York City. It's outrageous because there's not enough housing. There are other places like that as well. And in 1890, poor families really had difficult times. And they're going to live in these things called tenements. They're unhealthy. They're dangerous. They don't have windows. They don't have sanitation. And the other part of this is for poor workers, they had to live near their job. Those of you that live in Sullivan and you don't have a car and you're stuck in the position with your family says, if you want a car, you got to get a job and buy a car. If you don't live in the city limits and you don't live close, you are out of luck unless you have some really nice parents that were willing to drive you because you're not going to get to work because of that. Then that will be what poor workers will be faced with. Instead of being able to move far away from their jobs, they have to live close by their jobs, which means not only are they working in these polluted areas, they live in these polluted areas. And this is a typical tenement. Um, they're called dumbbell tenements. Is that your bell question today about the dumbbell tenements? It's either today or tomorrow. Okay, so it's called a dumbbell tenement, which I hope you can see that it looks like a dumbbell. So this is the stairwells, and then everything is out this way. Um, and you can see this is a tenement, this is a tenement, this is a tenement. And they're, they're all interior, no windows, um, no sanitation, no um, no ventilation, all of those things, uh, which make it very hazardous uh, environmentally for people to live. So that's one room of the tenement. And you've got that many people living in that one room and doing all of those things um, in that room that, again, hold in germs um, and all the, the um, unhealthy stuff that makes that difficult. At this time, cities had filthy unpaved streets. Remember all those horses that were in that street with all the streetcars. Those horses are pooping. Up until probably the mid 1860s, 1870s, pigs ran free in most cities. Reason being, pigs are going to eat all the, the garbage left on the street. We don't have sanitation. There's not weekly garbage pickup. And that, again, becomes breeding grounds for epidemics. And those epidemics, usually some type of um, um, disease that, cause is, that will cause um, um, chronic diarrhea, dehydration. Photographer and journalist Jacob Rice drew attention to these horrible conditions of New York tenements called How the Other Half Lives. You need to know this this uh, journalist and the name of his book from test. It's one of the most important books out of this time area era to let people understand the conditions, especially children were living in. So to solve these problems, governments and city planners tried to regulate housing, sanitation, sewers, and public health. And so some of those regulations with housing was the number of people that could be in housing, rent control, controlling the rent so the renter or so that owners couldn't jack up the rent, obviously sanitation, sewers, putting in sewers, and trying to control public health. And again, those of you that are interested in um, um, public health and medicine, but I don't want to be a doctor, I don't want to be a nurse, public health really is would be a career that you uh, would maybe like to think about. It is a medical career, but you don't have to go to nursing school. You don't have to be a doctor. Um, and you um, take on things like a current pandemic and uh, those types of things. So here's a couple pictures. 
So, kids just all lying asleep in garbage, holes in their shoes. This is a, a normal occurrence. Here is some of the um, tenement houses. That's a gang that's going to develop in that area. I would not want to walk down that alley. Uh, more children. Those little boys who all look to me like maybe between the ages of about four and six. No shoes. Sleeping on a grate. Um, this little girl taking care of a baby. This now would be like calling CPS kind of time. Like this little girl looks like she's about eight taking care of a baby. That could get you in trouble with Child Protective Services, leaving a child with another child to babysit. This is, a, this is called a flop house. So one of the ways, remember I told you that women would take on borders when we were back? This would be one of the ways that women could earn money. It's called a flop house because that's all you could do. At night, you come in, you flop down, you sleep, you get up and go. And if you notice, they have all their things tied up. They're sleeping all over the place. Each one of them probably paid a nickel or a dime to sleep there. And then she would feed them breakfast and then they would leave. And then they wouldn't come back until the evening and then come back and flop. This is the same as a flop house for women. Uh, that women would pay a dime to sleep, get in out of the um, cold. They could sleep there. And then in the morning they had to get up and leave. So these are the these are all of the child um, labor pictures that makes my little heart break. These are miners. These are boys working in coal mines, in the coal mines, going down into a coal mine. If any of you have family members that are miners, you know that that is a tough, difficult job. And let's go back to 1890 when we don't have any hydraulic equipment moving those things. Um, those little boys probably average start maybe around eight to 10 and we've got some older ones in the back and uh, working in a mine six days a week probably about 10 hours a day this one again the average person should stand all of that is moving equipment so we've got two barefoot boys working on all these spools are all moving this pulley is moving and their jobs again are to take these things is what they're doing these spools and put them on that. That's their job. And they move constantly. Constant movement. All right, almost done. Fire, crime, and conflicts. Our last thing our city planners have to deal with is crime. <coughs> and one of the issues will be the role of police in these cities. Um, Police officers during this time period uh, were not the same police officers that we have now. Uh, they were often as crooked and corrupt as the criminals they were prosecuting. One of the ways that many police officers made money was they hired thieves to work for them to go steal things. It was the practice, if the police found your items, you had to pay them to find your items. You paid them a finder's fee for finding your things. And lots and lots of police officers earned their money that way by hiring thieves, usually children, to go steal things from wealthy people, bring it to them. The wealthy people report it missing. The police officer pretend to do an investigation and then show up with Here's your vase. We got your vase. And then get a finder's fee. Then he would take the bigger part of the money and then split it with the urchins. It was very difficult. The police, are, again, are unable to overcome the challenge of conflicts, and mostly, again, because they were part of the conflicts. So there is um, early day police officers. Um, one of the other things, again, uh, is uh, making that those two jobs professionalized, uh, that some kind of training, some kind of uh, requirements to go with them. Here's one of the first um, fire trucks, high pressure fire department, New York. Um, and that again, 
probably moved at about maybe 10 miles an hour, uh, that fire truck. Uh, our last one, what challenges city dwellers meet? How did they, uh, and how they meet them? Again, really important question to look at for your um, test. All right, so your assignment that you're working on today and tomorrow is on Canvas. Let me get it and we'll go through that really quickly and explain that for you. So you are assuming the role of a city planner. So you've been hired as a city planner for New York City, and your first directive is to fix an urban problem. Your proposal must first explain the problem, why it's an urban problem, and then most importantly, what you would do to solve the problem. Remember, you're in 1890s, and you may only use technology available during the time period. Also, you can't just simply say to solve the short of housing is to build more houses, right? That's an easy. Where are you going to build them? Where are you going to get the funding? Who um, will give you the funding? Your proposal should thoroughly address all requirements listed in order to receive full points. Your proposal must be addressed to the mayor of New York City. Excuse me. And you are to choose one of these. Now, this is where you'll go over because you won't read that. You only have to do one. You'll just see that whole list and think you got to do all of them. Pick just one. So you can do shortage of housing, sanitation. Sanitation is two things. It's waste water from um, factories, and then it's waste, human waste from people. Um, zoning issues, you can start figuring out how cities or traffic controls. Okay. Uh, and then you'll just do that on a Google Doc and um, make sure, again, you tell the mayor what the problem is, how you would like to solve the problem, um, why and why it's a problem, okay? And that gives you three solid paragraphs that easily defined and laid out that you should be dealing with. All right, any questions about this? Okay, so we finished all that. There's no lecture to listen to tomorrow, just this assignment, okay? Are we good? This is one of my favorite assignments.